70 years ago, the Germans were confident of their defenses around the French coast. According to Nazi propaganda, their Atlantic Wall was an impregnable fortress overseen personally by General Rommel. The Allies needed to work out which landing site would be the best for their assault on occupied Europe. Nowhere seemed right. Brittany was too far from England, the currents along the Belgian coast were too strong, and Calais was exactly where the Germans expected attack, and so had concentrated their defenses. But the Allies found a chink in Rommel's armor, a part of Normandy the Nazis thought they had covered. The chart that we have here shows the locations and ranges and known arcs of fire for all the German gun batteries in the Normandy area. Here around Le Havre, there is a huge concentration of gun batteries. And similarly, over here around Cherbourg, you have a large number of big caliber weapons with big arcs of fire and quite clearly can be seen in the middle here, coming into the Normandy beaches, there was a, a gap where none of the guns could reach, which made a clear approach route for the ships in order to land the troops upon the beaches here. The decision was made. The invasion would take place on the Normandy coast at five different beaches codenamed Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. And when the assault arrived at dawn on 6th of June, 1944, this armada would be of unimaginable scale. A fleet of 1,200 warships would unleash hellfire upon the German defenses. Then over 3,000 landing craft of extraordinary variety would head for the beaches. These landing craft were the key to an allied success because they could deliver the large numbers of men and machines necessary to smash down and overrun the impregnable wall. D-Day is a triumph of, of technology and engineering. The best example of that is, is the incredible range of landing crafts that were involved. We think of a landing craft and we think of something like a shoebox with a ramp, um, but actually there were 30, 40, 50 different types of shoe boxes with ramps um, designed to get infantry ashore, different ones to get tanks ashore. Each of them has a specific job. Over a year before D-Day, the Allies were gathering detailed surveillance information about Normandy. This was absolutely essential to know where and how strong the Nazi coastal defenses were. And they gathered information from any source they possibly could. They put out of a public request for the people of Britain to say, any postcards you collected in your holidays to France before the war, send them in to us. And they were reproduced in order to give troops information that, as to what it looked like before the war. High altitude observations located larger German defenses. But for crucial close-up detail, they needed help from the people who lived in occupied Normandy, the resistance. <laughs> Paulette Heron, codenamed Marianne, was a member of the French resistance intelligence network Rainbow, along with her father and husband. Moi, j'étais lieutenant de Galon. Mon mari, c'était le chef de réseau pour toute la Normandie et l'heure. De surveiller les mouvements des troupes, le nombre de permissionnaires, les trains, toutes les the zones côtières, etc. The French resistance managed to recruit workers helping to reinforce the German defenses. On avait un type, un Roumain, qui nous passait tous les renseignements. Chaque fois qu'il y avait un changement dans l'armement du blocos, etc., bon, ben, on était au courant, ils nous disaient. The resistance would send this intelligence to London via carrier pigeon or through agents they smuggled out. A few days before D-Day, the Germans uncovered Paulette's rainbow network. 
En un seul coup, on a dû en avoir une trentaine qui ont été pris et qui ont été fusillés. Collard, le lièvre, la côte, pff, mon père. The sacrifices made in France helped the Allied command map the Normandy coast in fine detail. We have here a map, an assault map of the Sword Beach area. The maps were intended to show the obstacles that would be in the way and indications as to where you may find the weapons that would be facing you. What all this intelligence revealed to the Allied high command was that German defenses on the five beaches were truly formidable. At 05.50 a.m., the might of the 1,200-strong naval force hammered the Normandy coastline. 30 minutes later, the first wave of landing craft began carrying the 200,000 terrified troops to shore. American infantry headed for Omaha and Utah beaches. British, Canadian and Free French sped towards Juneau, Sword and Gold. Seven kilometers west of Jim's submarine, over 20,000 Allied troops were approaching Juneau Beach. In the vanguard on Juneau was Lieutenant Ian Hamilton. We didn't know at first that we were going to be the first wave, but we guessed that we were because nobody was going to go in front of us. But Ian wasn't a foot soldier. He was in a tank, and no ordinary tank. Hobart's Funnies, named after Maverick Major General Percy Cleghorn Stanley Hobart, these were specially adapted tanks that demonstrate the ingenuity involved in D-Day. The flamethrower, the ditch filler, the bridge builder, for every kind of obstacle placed on the beaches by the Germans came an ingenious method to remove them. First onto the beaches came bulldozer tanks, designed to clear steel and concrete barbed obstacles. Then Ian landed his flail tank on Juno Beach. Fitted with weighted chains, his tank was designed to beat a path through the deadly minefields for troops to follow on. My landing map suffered a bit from seawater. I landed here with two other flails. But things went wrong from the start. The bulldozer tanks failed to clear all beach defenses at Juno. Ian's tank got stuck on an anti-tank ramp and was unable to go forward or back. The tide had come in and had swamped us and put the engine out. So I had to bail out with my crew. We carried as many boxes of ammo as we could and drop off into five feet of water up to here. And it was very difficult to get out of the water onto the foot of the ramp, which was covered with seawater and bodies of Canadians which is a very hard thing to do, as you can imagine. Um, anyway. Ian and his crew would clear mines on Juno, but on foot, with a machine gun, not with a flail tank. The D-Day plan required troops to bury the enemy in a continuous flow of men, immediately backed up by heavily armed support. And it worked. On every beach except one. Omaha. Where US troops suffered 2,000 casualties within minutes of landing. The US bombing of the Omaha area failed in its objective. The German defences 
including 20 heavy guns and 35 rocket launcher sites, remained intact and fully operational. The US Navy, under heavy fire, took the decision to launch the DD tanks further out to sea than planned. But they had never been designed for these rough seas. The skirts filled with seawater and dragged the tanks to the bottom, one by one. American troops rushed up the beaches here, unaware there would be no tank support behind them. So then you got all that distance to cover. The machine gun position over there, machine gun position there, grazing fire, interlocking fields of fire. Everything that was supposed to be destroyed is still there and it's still intact. Now imagine the shock that's going through the minds of soldiers as they hit the beach. Nothing, absolutely nothing, as, as they were told uh, that it would be. A massacre was inevitable. Within a few minutes, 2,000 US troops were killed, injured, or went missing in action on Omaha Beach. Finally, US warships edged closer to the beach and fired on the German defenses at close range. The maneuver reduced the enemy fire, which allowed troops to progress up the beach. Twelve hours after the Armada had arrived, the Allied soldiers had knocked out German defenses and secured all five beaches. After more than one year of exhaustive preparation, the D-Day landings had succeeded. 150,000 men landed on French soil in one day. And Europe, occupied by the Nazis for five bloody years, was about to be liberated. But freedom came at a price. On D-Day alone, many hundreds of French civilians and over 4,000 Allied soldiers were killed. 19-year-old Bill Allen was a nurse on the landing ship tank 523. For over a week after D-Day, Bill tended to casualties on the beaches. It, it was a confusion, a hatred, I guess, with everybody. We wanted to get things over with and back home. I saw many, many deaths. Bill's ship delivered supplies from England to Normandy and then brought back the injured and dead. I was on the death detail of going back. We would uh, clean them up after they died, uh, identify them to the dog tags, and uh, then wrap them in a blanket and put them in a cooler and take them back to England. We made three trips in uh, successfully and started on a fourth trip. I had finished lunch, come out on top side and uh, stand over next to the rail. Minutes later, there would be 117 more casualties of the Normandy landings, all of them Bill's shipmates. 